My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity One on One. If you guys enjoy this podcast, please consider showing your support by either writing a brief review on iTunes or by simply making a donation. Today, my guests on the show are Miguel Nicolelis and Ronald Sicurel. Welcome to Singularity One on One, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, let me ask you j just this little detail. Did I pronounce your names correctly? Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Very well. Good. Thank you. Um, now, for those of our viewers and listeners who may not be familiar with what uh, you work on, can you please introduce yourselves in a couple of sentences? Okay. Please stop, Miguel. Well, uh, my name is Miguel Nicolelis. I'm a professor of neurobiology and biomedical engineering and director of the Center for Neuroengineering at Duke University in the United States. I'm a neuroscientist and I have worked for 30 years recording brainstorms, you know, the electrical activity of large populations of neurons. And about 16 years ago, together with my good friend John Chapin, I introduced a paradigm called Brain Machine Interface which has evolved very quickly in the last decade and a half to become both a new area of neuroscience research, basic research, but also uh, translated into a variety of uh, potential clinical applications for restoring mobility in patients that have suffered from neurological disorders. And you, Ronald? Uh, my name is Roland Securel. I'm a mathematician, and uh, I'm mainly working at EPFL the Polytechnic Federal School in Lausanne. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as a mathematician, I participated in the beginning of the Blue Brain Project, who then gave birth to the Human Brain Project, uh, who is financed by the European community. Um, it's by working with the Blue Brain Project that I really got interested in the brain and started thinking about the problems that uh, simulating the brain could uh, could bring up on a mathematical point of view. Uh, we met at the same time with Miguel and started having long discussions for, for about the 10 last years. Uh, and uh, our book is the result of these 10 years of discussions. Wow, so, so you were collaborating on the ideas in, this, in, in your book uh, for 10 years? Yeah, we started, uh, we met in 2005, and since then we have been talking for a long time. We write, we started writing this book in 2013, uh, and it took uh, about 18 months, almost two years to, to get it done, finished. Uh, but yes, it's, a, it's a close to a 10-year collaboration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me just make sure we are very clear and explicit about the book that we are going to be discussing today and that is The Relativistic Brain, How It Works and Why It Cannot Be Simulated by a Turing Machine. Um, I have to say, I enjoyed this book uh, the past weekend, and even though it's uh, not a very voluminous book, uh, in my, uh, to my knowledge, it presents the best, uh, most coherent, uh, most comprehensive uh, attack, if you will, uh, on, on the singularity. Uh, which is why it's so fascinating to have you two on my show today. Uh, but before we get to, to, to the book, uh, I can't help it but ask Miguel a couple of questions on the Walk Again project because it's so fascinating and it's also going to help our audience to kind of get an idea about where he's coming from, what his starting point is. So many of you guys may have actually seen uh, Miguel, uh, Miguel's uh, work during the opening of the World uh, uh, Football or Soccer uh, Cup in, in Brazil. Uh, where a paraplegic uh, initiated the first game by kicking off the bell, uh, uh, the ball by wearing an exoskeleton, uh, and he kicked the ball with a brain-machine interface that was designed by a team uh, where Miguel played a crucial role. So, would you mind sharing a little bit about that with us, Miguel? Sure. Yes. The the Walker Green Project is an international nonprofit consortium that involved about 156 people from 25 countries 
about 100 scientists of these guys, uh, uh, of these 156, working together with the idea of developing the first brain control exoskeleton for lower limbs that could also provide uh, real-time tactile feedback to the user. So the idea was to demonstrate a, a prototype of uh, uh, a brain-machine interface that can allow a paraplegic patient to imagine walking and kicking, but at the same time being able to feel the kick. And that's exactly what happened. We had eight patients trained for about uh, now almost uh, 18 months. Uh, and uh, we were able to, to get Giuliano Pinto, one of the patients that has uh, paralysis, a complete paralysis from the mid-chest down, to, to be there on the side uh, uh, sidelines of the, uh, the soccer field in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, on June 12, 2014. And uh, basically, Giuliano was able to use his brain activity to kick the ball, to, to open the World Cup, and uh, and you know immediately he was he was telling us he was screaming as he celebrated that he could feel the impact he felt the ball, and the most beautiful thing besides the being able to demonstrate this is that 18 months later all eight patients are showing neurological improvement. Uh, they are showing that they increase the amount of the body that they can feel something below the level of the lesion what nobody expected. And also, they are showing more muscle control below the level of the lesion to a point in which uh, one of the patients can now simulate uh, walking movements in the air without the exoskeleton. So we somehow induce such a degree of uh, brain plasticity with the training that we use for the exo that we may have actually helped recover some of the neurological functions that were lost because of the original lesion. So. We are sending papers out about these results right now, but it suggests that uh, when we design brain machine interfaces, we thought that brain machine interfaces would be just a therapeutic uh, rehabilitation, a rehab tool to restore mobility. I think we have crossed a higher par uh, threshold now by suggesting with these results that BMIs can improve neurological function as you get proficient in using them. That kind of reminds me to the use it or lose it kind of idea, or maybe even not not so, but even the the more you practice, the better you get at it, and and the more proficient you become. Uh, what's the kind of ultimate end of that neuroplastic plastic effect? Yeah, well, the, the, it's, it's even part of our conversation here, and you probably saw that in the book. Uh, the brain is continuously adapting to basically better uh, interpret the statistics of the world around. So the brain is in continuous flux. And what we discover with brain machine interfaces is that if you take advantage of this uh, plasticity, this continuous rearrangement of function and morphological structure of the brain, you may be able to restore uh, functions that have been lost either to trauma or, or disease. So we are basically taking a, a ride on top of this plasticity wave and trying to direct it uh, in order to improve the quality of life of the patients. And it turned out that when you interface the brain with devices uh, and provide feedback that is rich, you seem apparently to potentiate this plasticity. Uh, and uh, that's what we are seeing right now. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And of course, the other... Uh kind of way that you made headlines uh, not long ago was the first brain-to-brain -brain communication. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. In fact, there is a paper coming in a few days, another sequel paper. Uh, but the first paper was a proof of concept where we got uh, two rats uh, basically to exchange a mental message. And uh, one rat was doing a task and he was basically sending an instruction to a second rat that was not performing the task, but had to make a decision. And what we did was to send a, a snippet, a very simple uh, message from the first brain to the second brain, and the second animal learned to guide uh, its decision based on what he got from the first brain. And then uh, basically we created a, a loop between these two animals because the reward of the first animal that was broadcasting the message for the second that we call decoder, 
The first was the encoder, the second the decoder. The reward of the encoder, the first animal, depended on the performance of the second guy. So when the second guy didn't perform well, the first guy only got half of its reward and that didn't make him a happy camper. So we noticed an adaptation uh, that happened in the first animal's brain. He basically increased the signal to noise of its brain and made the movements smoother so the second guy could actually uh, have an uh, easier time uh, interpreting the information. And that's when the second guy started performing better and the first guy got more reward. So that's when we saw that we could establish a collaborative environment just through this loop. And in, a, in about a few days, probably this week, we don't know for sure yet, but we have a paper showing that uh, groups of monkeys, two or three monkeys can collaborate mentally to achieve a common task that is subdivided in subtasks. Each monkey is, is performing a, a subcomponent of a main task and they are mixing their brains in a super brain that actually controls the device. And we show that the monkeys readily learn to synchronize their brains uh, so that all get a reward, uh, provided that this uh, artificial device is moved uh, under the control of what we call a shared brain machine interface or a brain net. So we're just demonstrating that you can put multiple subjects connected uh, to achieve a common task. That's, that's of course, absolutely fascinating. Uh, but let me ask you this, Ronald. Uh, so we kind of established uh, Miguel's uh, starting point of view and, and background and, and its relevance to our conversation today. Well, what's fascinating about you is that you kind of started on the other side of the argument, didn't you? Or at least it, it looks like it to me. So you were part of the, of, of, of the Blue Brain project, uh, which of course uh, became the, 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 the Human Brain project, which got a billion dollars worth of funding for the next 10 years. And then you somehow evolved to cross the line and to say it's kind of absolutely meaningless and, and wasteful even to spend all that money on that kind of research. So would you mind sharing with us kind of the journey that, that you had in, and that intellectual evolution of, of your kind of approach to this process? Well, I must say what attracted me to the, to the Blue Brain project at the beginning was First of all, perhaps the personality of Henry Markham, who is a very clever and charismatic man. And <clears throat> he seemed also, also very, and he was very open to many kind of discussions. And uh, I like discussing. And secondly, I was intrigued by the question that has always puzzled me uh, since I had uh, at school uh, Lilia there of Omer, where there's also a sort of brain simulation. Uh, I've been always puzzled, can we reproduce that thing that we have uh, between the years or can't we reproduce it? Well, where, where are the problems? So I started learning neuroscience a little bit that I didn't know at all before that. But obviously I was seeing it through uh, the mathematical point of view. And the first thing that came to my mind is, uh, is uh, Gödel's theorem. Uh, Gödel's theorem that says basically that uh, there are, in the formal system, things that are true but cannot be proven to be true by the formal system. So the question obviously is, how do we know that they are true? What knows that they are true? Are there truths who, who escape to the formal systems and uh, uh, but do not escape to the human brain? So I read Gödel again and I read, read his letters and he seemed completely convinced that uh, the human brain has capacity that could not be formalized. Uh, and in fact, it's something that we all know. We all know that whatever we say about our feelings is not our feelings. It's different between saying something and feeling something. And whatever you say, it will never describe completely what you feel. So I wondered how this could be integrated and what were the manifestations of this question in, in a brain simulation? And uh, obviously the questions got deeper and deeper, and that's how I came, I came to it. And <clears throat> I, I had the feeling at the given moment uh, that those projects were guided by the buzz and by the, the rumors and by the...
city and the hype. Uh, and uh, I didn't feel comfortable with that because more and more the project advanced, more uh, the real questions were not discussed. What was discussed were the budgets, the, the, <clears throat> the technologies, how to do it, who would do it, uh, how much do I get, how much do you get. So uh, I lost a little bit of interest. Uh, so where was that break point for you? Where was that break point where you were very interested in the whole process and the whole project and suddenly at some point you realize that it's kind of misguided, if you will? Well, was there exactly a break? Yeah, there was there were, were a break point where I, where I saw that I couldn't really get any discussion anymore with anybody. For instance, when I asked, I started asking about how, how will you simulate the magnetic fields in the brain and uh, I couldn't get any answer. Uh, uh, and I don't know if I avoided them or if they avoided me. Uh, it goes in the, in, in the two directions. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps they didn't want to see me anymore, I don't know. But um, uh, that was about 2009, I would say. So I stayed about four years uh, with, uh, with Henry. Uh, but it didn't stop me thinking about the question. Mm -hmm. And to be to be forthcoming, I've been uh, asking uh, after doing 170 interviews. Henry Markram is one of the few people that I haven't been able to interview just yet on my show, uh, and so far he hasn't been responding to my email. Uh, but I will keep I will keep trying. Perhaps after this interview, he would feel compelled to push forward his his own personal point of view there's, there's one interesting aspect that I, I couldn't avoid saying because i was doing my sabbatical I, I the reason i met ronald is because i came from duke to dpfl in november 2005 to do my sabbatical for and i stayed for uh, two years and that was the beginning of the blue brain project and that's when we start talking uh, ronald and i about some of these questions but you know he was part of the project and i was not i was trying to do my own stuff there. And uh, at that point, the end of 2006, beginning of 2007, I had all the doubts that are here in the book. And I also clearly start talking to Henry about it and manifesting my concerns, you know, as a neuroscientist, particularly because I was seeing that that was becoming more of a marketing project than, than a real scientific project. And, and nobody would say a word. There was no scientific opposition in Europe at that time. Uh, and it was very interesting to see it. And, and that was really a clear point where the dialogue ended, you know, and, and we couldn't really do much more because there were no ears to hear uh, the concerns. And now when the, I, we were in Switzerland uh, a month ago, uh, about uh, April 1st, I gave a talk here on an EPFL meeting. It was the day after the European uh, Union basically, from my point of view, closed the door on the Human Brain Project. You know, they're, they're showing that it's, it's going to continue as an IT project, but, but basically everything has changed. Everything has been modified. The, the former leadership at EPFL is gone. Uh, the project is now going to be taken over by, by a European, not a Swiss uh, center. And it's almost like it's starting to crumble, you know. And in response to uh, about 600 neuroscientists that last summer wrote a letter in prote protesting, you know, ab about the, the management of the project. However, very little was said about the scientific issues until recently when the European Union issued a report and and there was some discussion about the science but but the scientific uh, concerns were never uh, on the forefront of the criticisms or, or the debate that's what was very surprising to us mm -hmm. I have to say I've had a number of people on my show who have come up with similar skepticism as you. Marvin Minsky said it's a total waste of time and he even warned that it may lead to nuclear winter because it's going to waste so much money that people would lose interest investing afterwards. Uh, Noam Chomsky was a skeptic because he said that they have no theory of mind or no idea 
uh, with which to approach and kind of comprehend the, any potential data that they might gather. Uh, another researcher from the Max Planck Institute in Germany called Danko Nikolic, who has this practopoiesis theory, he also said it's a total waste of time. So th there have been many skeptics here on my show. Of course, there have been a few proponents too. Um, but uh, I think it's time for us to jump into the, the sort of the, the meat of the matter here and start discussing uh, your book. So let's see how are we going to uh, divide the, the, the arguments on your end of things. But let me ask you the, to start with the general question. What is the relativistic brain about? Well, basically, is a is a real new theory about how the brain works, based on you know thirty years of uh, experiments performed in living, behaving animals, uh, recording populations of neurons in in these animals. You know, you have to realize when I came to neuroscience thirty years ago, uh, most of these recordings were done in anesthetized animals. You were recording only one neuron at a time, so the the view of the brain was being described by the viewpoint of a single neuron recording. Everything was reduced to the single neuron because that was the data we could get. There was no MRI machines, there were no uh, electrophysiological recordings of uh, like we can do now, 2,000 neurons. And so after I, I you know, spent 30 years recording from mice to humans now, and I try to make sense of the old classic theory, I couldn't fit it because that theory was built, the classical dogma neuroscience for the most part, was built based on uh, a brain that is deeply anesthetized close to death, you know, where the richness of the dynamics of the brain cannot be appreciated. And that's when we, when we start doing the brain machine interface experiments, we could see that uh, neuronal firing change as a matter of the context of the task, as a matter of what the animal is doing, whether the animal is actively sampling or just passively receiving information. We could see that information was coded by population. So we could see the plasticity was the dominant force of the brain and the dynamics of the brain dominated any other construct that people had come up with, maps, columns. I, I could never see those things. I could see just dynamics. And that's where uh, in 2011, I published my first book, uh, Beyond Boundaries, and I tried to introduce this concept of the brain's own point of view, that everything is seen by the brain from its point of view, not ours as a scientist. And that's where, in talking to Ronald too at that time, uh, we came up with this uh, notion of the, the, the possibility of building a complete new theory based on the brain's own point of view, but for doing that, I had to reconcile all the data that I have collected all these years in multiple species. And that's when I came with these principles of neuro ensemble physiology. Mm -hmm. And to put this all together in the framework, we had to come up with a new concept. And the new concept, what I like to call the internal engine of the brain, is this a space-time continuum. Uh, you know, the brain forms this fusion of time, neuronal timing and space. And for that to happen, we had to come up with a different way, not only a digital uh, model of the brain. And that's where, you know, John, uh, uh, talking to Ronald, we came up with this hybrid uh, digital analog computational engine that, as far as we can tell, right now is the only thing that can be used to reconcile all these huge data sets that have been collected. And that's where the relativistic theory comes from. Mm -hmm. So you have two theses in your book. One is the relativistic brain theory itself. What's the other one? Um, the relativistic brain is a, is a theory of the brain, a model of the brain that has one characteristic. It's not simulable on a digital computer. Uh, so it, we didn't build it for to show that uh, uh, the human brain was not similar to a digital computer, but it happened that it was the only theory that reconciled the data that Miguel had collected, and this theory was not computable. So uh, there was not uh, similar on a digital computer. So uh, we tried to understand 
what are those physical objects who are not similar on the digital computer? What are the limitations of the digital computer? And we try to come here with arguments uh, who are from mathematics, from philosophy, from evolution, and from neuroscience. The main idea, uh, I, I would say, the one who's the most easy to approach is to understand, is the difference between a mechanism and an organism. Uh, what, a mechanism is something who is man-built by adding one piece of the, the other. Uh, and we have tendency to suppose that everything can be done this way, by adding one piece of, after the other, by building. And uh, in the Blue Brain project, they used to say, we will reverse engineer the brain. But the brain has never been engineered. Engineering a brain means we have a blueprint in advance, and we are going to build what is in our blue brain. There, was, there has never been a blue brain for the brain. It has evolved as an organ. So um, there are deep differences in things who have evolved and things that are man-built. Um, so we try to reconcile the mathematical point of view, uh, who, whose issue from, from this good, good old theorems, uh, the uh, the organic versus mechanic point of view and the evolutionary point of view into one into different approaches who lead to the same to the same conclusions uh, the brain the higher functions of the brain are not similarable you said that uh, before that uh, it was a waste of time and of money I, uh, trying to simulate the brain. Perhaps it's not a complete waste. We are surely going to learn something. There are parts of the brain who work digitally and that we can simulate digitally. There are things to learn, obviously. But it's not a really good investment. Not to the point of $1 billion. Yeah, but, but there's one there's one thing also that I think is important to emphasize, even though it may take too long to discuss it. The, the second part of the book, I think the central point of the second part of the book, uh, there are two things. One, there is another type of information besides Shannon information. We call it in honor of God, Godelian information. And that's the kind of information that cannot be uh, 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 decided, computed to be truth by a formal system. That is a information that is embedded in organic matter that we are fortunate to be able to recall some of it because we can talk, we can write as humans, but that information is embedded in matter. And the other concept that is very vital is that uh, organic systems, organisms and like the brain, they compute with their matter. They compute following the laws of physics. Like, you know, when you have a protein and you drop this protein in solution, that protein folds instantaneously in its optimal uh, configuration uh, to simulate that it would take the age of the universe if you have a very long uh, amino acid chain but the protein assumes that configuration and computes and that's exactly the way we see the brain so we are introducing in that argument uh, a new form of computation a new type of computation and a new type of information and I think those are the very powerful new ideas uh, in, in there yeah, I have a, a list here and I hope to, to get through them one by one, but I want to backtrack a little bit further and kind of lay down the foundation a little bit better. So, Miguel, one of the things which surprised me a little bit uh, when you said that you were skeptical from the very beginning was that, you know, I've interviewed a number of neuroscientists who would have been optimistic from the very beginning. So perhaps now is the time for you to tell us a little bit more about what is computationalism and why do you think it's wrong? Yes, uh, let me say it. Of course, I'm always optimistic for anything that relates to investing time, uh, uh, intelligence and money in science, because if it's done in a you know, very honest and a very uh, industrial way with people that are passionate about it, you're always going to get something good, you know. So uh, in the beginning, when I saw the project, I also thought that, you know, hey, if this catalyzes interest into the brain and more scientists and more people come aboard, 
so so better you know so much for for all the difficulties we go there and do the best we can but unfortunately that was not the the main pathway i saw uh what you know what i was critical since the beginning was the idea that you could reduce human attributes to an algorithm that you could actually uh reduce the richness and the range of the spectrum, the things that the things that we do as humans, to a sequence of instructions that can be uh, performed by a Turing machine, and that's when you know uh, Ronald introduced me to the to the concept of computer computerism, and I don't even know how to pronounce it correctly, as you can see, <laughs> but uh, it was for me it was uh, from all that I have seen in the lab, but also from my intuition, which by the way is a non-computable. <laughs> uh, property of the brain, it, it, it could not be right because we do not, uh, uh, just from a starting point, we know that you cannot define beauty, uh, creativity, intuition in algorithmic terms. You know, it, it simply doesn't work. So that's where I came from. And it was funny because here I was interfacing brains to machines and everybody that I meet thinks that I would be on the other camp. Exactly. That's the presumption. <laughs> exactly. And, and, but I'm not. And I have put that in the record for many times in many talks and many interviews I gave before. Uh, because I, my point of view is that uh, an organism can assimilate an artificial device. Uh, by doing BMI research, I have shown that the primate brain and the human brain can assimilate an artificial uh, arm or leg as part of the body representation that the brain carries. But the opposite cannot be done. Hmm. Okay? So, and, and, and it's, I think it surprises people when I say that because many people come to me and say, oh, your work is very important for the transhuman movement, but I'm not part of the transhuman movement. You know, I'm part of the of the movement that believes in in the man, in man, in humanity, in, in the human condition. You know, that's my movement. And uh, and we thought, you know, one of the reasons it may sound strange, but one of the reasons that Ronald and I felt compelled to write this book is to actually defend human nature, is to show that uh, there is a danger of us yeah. losing that. You know. Yeah, yeah I would like to add here. Uh, in fact, it's, a, it's an old fight between materialism and dualism that you have here. Uh, if you're a science guy, you're meant to be materialist. That means everything is this, can be described by matter. And things who are not matter, as they don't exchange energy with matter, they simply don't exist. So it's impossible for, for a science, uh, scientific man to accept uh, Descartes' dualism with the soul and the, and the body, that, that's excluded. The soul cannot exist, so everything must be inside the matter, part of the matter. And what we have uh, uh, sketched with this, uh, with this book, I don't know if, it's, uh, if you can understand it properly by reading it, but I suppose it's, it's in there, is a sort of new dualism, a sort of scientific dualism, where there are things that you can measure, and, uh, and there are things that you cannot measure. Why, you were speaking about computerism before, but where does this hypothesis that you can always separate software from hardware come from? Is it more than a hypothesis? Uh, are there things where you cannot separate the software from the hardware? By trying to separate, you destroy the hardware itself. Um, and I think uh, the brain is surely an object of this type. You can't extract a soft, the software from the brain. There's no, there's no software in that sense. It's not a software running on a hardware. The, both things are embedded. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me just uh, uh, for a little bit to, to bring a little, attempt to bring a little clarity here by by reading a couple of passages from the very beginning of your book, which I think would kind of help us set the foundation here. This comp uh, so here's your definition of computationalism, which you have there. 
Computation is the view that states that, that states that since the brain is a physical entity, it must obey the laws of physics, which can be simulated on a digital computer. And then you raise the, the question, which is the main question that your book seeks to answer, which is, uh, first you go on to say, very little scientific scrutiny has been given to examining the very basic tenant of this proposal. And so, therefore, in your view, the most important question is, can a digital machine simulate a human brain? And then you go on to say that your thesis is uh, based on mathematical, computational, evolutionary, neurophysiological arguments is to deny the feasibility of any such claims. So that's, that's a very tall order and it's a, it's a very ambitious uh, and, and, and strong argument that, that draws on a number of uh, different disciplines. So uh, let me ask us to proceed our conversation by, by this. What are the testable predictions of uh, the relativistic brain theory that you postulate forward? Uh, or in other words, how do you falsify it? Yeah, we, you know, that, that's a wonderful question. And in, in fact, we probably we have one of the few books right now that has an appendix with appendix one has a, a 20 some predictions that could uh, allow us to falsify the relativistic theory, uh, uh, the brain theory. And of course, there, there are many interesting things that we can do to try to verify or falsify. First of all, we are predicting that in addition to the well-known cortical magnetic fields that people measure with magnetoencephalography these days, that we would find subcortical magnetic fields that would help uh, together with the cortical ones uh, to create this space-time continuum, to fuse the neuronal timing and neuronal space. This that has never been done. Uh, and we have some simulations that we're running now in the lab, and we want to get to the matter of actually directly measuring whether these fields are there, which we think they are. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, they should be there. But what is the magnitude? Whether the magnitude is strong enough to actually produce in inductive currents that can lead to widespread synchronization. That is one of the predictions, widespread synchronization prior to the engagement on on a particular task, on a particular, you know, perceptual, or motor, or cognitive task. You know, this is just to give you some neurophysiological uh, ideas. Uh, one of the things that uh, is very interesting is that uh, when we started this discussion, uh, Ronald came to me and, you know, I knew of the church Turing hypothesis. And I always took for granted that that hypothesis applied to the material world. And then, uh, as we say in chapter three, in the beginning of chapter three, uh, Ronald came and said, look, this is, this is an, a, a, a hypothesis that applies to the mathematical world, to mathematical conjectures. And it has been mistakenly translated into the physical world as that if that transduction could be done automatically. You know, because when you say that every mathematical function that is uh, believed to be computable can be computed by, by a Turing machine, you're really applying that just to mathematical uh, conjectures, mm -hmm. right? So it, that, I think, is important to emphasize. That was our starting point. That's where things became very clear to me. And that's when these predictions that you see here in Appendix 1, they, uh, they merge very nicely with the predictions of non-computability of the brain. So in, what I'm trying to say is that if we verify that the relativistic brain theory is correct, we are basically falsifying the claim that the brain can be computed by a Turing machine. Yeah, and, and, and in the process of doing that, you're basically uh, uh, kind of negating the arguments put forward not only by Dr. Henry Macron, but of course by Ray Kurzweil. Oh, absolutely, yes. And, and of course, other companies who, for example, Google, who's hired Mr. Kurzweil to create uh, the mind uh, following his book, uh, How to Create a Mind. Well, they'll be in trouble. <laughs> because he's not going to create no mind. He may create some sort of machine intelligence, which is a different aspect, you know. 
we mentioned this in the book that uh, you could have a very uh, uh, as an outcome of artificial intelligence to produce uh, machines that in, uh, pr express some sort of machine intelligence. And uh, I think we need to emphasize this: there will be great applications for that that could be very good for 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 mankind. What we are denying is not the relevance of research on artificial intelligence. We are just uh, denying the claim that research in artificial intelligence uh, is going to produce entities that are more intelligent than us. You know, that is our focal point. You know, this is very important. We have nothing against technology, nothing against research in computer science, you know? Yeah, and it's a powerful argument, I have to, I have to admit. So you make those 27 kind of uh, testable predictions, or 23 actually. Uh, at the end of the book in Appendix 1, which is, which is a, a very neat way to have everything at the end. So five or ten years later down the road, you can go down the list and you can start ticking things off and saying, we were right about this, wrong about this, or you can kind of do a comprehensive analysis. But uh, let me ask you this, Ronald. Tell us a little bit more about the mathematics, the mathematical arguments against the, the singularity, because you have a deep variety of them. Uh, and and you, you give examples such as the halting problem, non-tractable problems, irreducible, uh, non-algorithmic uh, kind of uh, phenomenon which uh, are biological usually in nature. Uh, and of course, uh, you've already mentioned Godel's incompleteness theorem. So perhaps you can run us through a few of those. Um, yeah. Uh... There are computability problems, uh, but first of all, we should say that when you when you uh, want to simulate something, you have to sort of measure it. You have to take a photo and you have to build some uh, mathematical formula who describes it. You're never sure that you've built the right mathematical formula, and your mathematical formula is something different from the object itself. Uh, so, when you're speaking about computability, you're speaking about the formula you have built, not about the, the object. Um, it is the case that when you are dealing with complex systems, you often happen to have uh, equations who are not computable, that you cannot reduce to, to, to an algorithm. So that's one kind of problem, and when you're describing the brain, obviously you're having uh, functions that are not computable. But um, you could say I'm simplifying them. That's what they are doing in those projects like Blue Brain. I'm simplifying them. I'm making, making some algorithm who approximates the thing. When, when you do that, you should ask yourself, is approximation sufficient when you're dealing about the brain? Uh, what kind of approximation do you need? Or if you approximate, aren't you losing the main part of what you're trying to describe? Uh, here you're dealing with 100 billion neurons, uh, trillions of, of synapses, of spikes, uh, timing who, who is very relevant for each one of them, is an approximation sufficient? So you must ask yourself those questions. What will I get by approximating? Um, <clears throat> so you have all those questions related to the tractability of the functions and the, the, question, the, the, the fact that you are approximating and not, uh, and not describing using the real, fun the real mathematical function that you had derived at the beginning. Then there are many questions related to the levels of, of what you're doing. If you, if you approximate and really simply want a, a, a low level, low resolution level, I'm sure you can do it, but you will not get the higher functions of the brain. You'll get a, something that's a little bit more than a picture, but not the higher functions. So what do you need to get the higher functions? You could distinguish at least 10 or 12 levels, uh, scale levels, that you, you would need to, uh, to observe in the brain if you wanted to, to, uh, to describe it properly. Uh, <clears throat> remaining at one level will never be sufficient. You, 
you have to go all the way from the, 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 the molecules up to the brain as a, a global brain as an entity. And when you think of the fact that even the folding of one protein, we cannot simulate it, uh, how are you going to go through the 12 levels? So let me tell you one thing that I think is important to have in there because it's down to earth mathematics for a poor neurobiologist that mm -hmm. sees that problem every day. Uh, when I go to my students at Duke, when I talk to my computer science students or my neuroscience students, you know, engineering students, and I go and say, so what do you, what do you think about non-computable mathematical functions? They look at me and say, what? What is that? They don't know. <laughs> they literally don't know. I, I did a test in a little course. There were about 10 students. Nine, when I said that, had no idea what I was talking about. Which means that for a lot of people, computer scientists, engineers, you know, uh, even some mathematicians, uh, people are not aware that there are mathematical functions that cannot be solved analytically and cannot be reduced to an algorithm. And that's where the problem starts, in my opinion. You know, looking from outside, you know, this issue, not being a mathematician, that is the beginning. Because people assume that everything can be computed. Yeah, and that's why it's called computationalism, and, and that's a very popular presumption. Uh, but actually, when I was reading that part of the book, that reminded me to two philosophers who entirely agree with you. Uh, well, one of them is kind of half and half. So the first one is Plato. Plato, on the one hand, he thought that everything can be expressed in mathematics because he was a Pythagorean. But on the other hand, he has this allegory of the cave. And when I was reading about your reading your argument, I was thinking, so it looks like you're saying that the scientists are these people stuck in that cave and mathematics is the, are those shadows on the wall, those mere pale shadows which reflect the real objects, but they're definitely not them. But they're so focused on them that they actually start taking the shadows for the real objects and they don't realize how inaccurate they are and how far from reality. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's very nice. That's a nice analogy. Yeah. And, and so, and the other, by the way, uh, uh, person that says something very close to that is Alan Watts. Uh, together with many other uh, Zen masters. Uh, he says, those who are uh, in love with language or mathematics live in the realm of illusions because they fail to uh, comprehend the fact that mathematics or language are not the real things. The name of a thing is not the real thing. The mathematical representation of a thing is not the real thing. And if you focus too much on the language, you are living in the world of illusions because you fail to see the real object. And he says in that way, it's fair to say that poetry is, is the art of trying to say what cannot be said in words. You know, painting is the art of trying to paint something which cannot be captured with the paintbrush. Right. So and many poets are are well, well aware of that kind of uh, paradox at, at, the, at the core of poetry, for example. Yeah, but you just described ex two examples of what for us is Godelian information. Exactly. is information that cannot be described by channel information or by a formal system. It's everything that escapes the realm of a formal system, you know? And, uh, and for us, we, when we discuss, we, we, jo we joke. In fact, it's going to be the title of our next book. We joke that the brain is the true creator of everything. Mm-hmm. It creates everything, including mathematics and our science. So we we have a, a, a inside joke between us that says, you know, we are very proud of our science and our mathematics, and we should be, you know, because it's the best uh, description of what we can see and experience from out there. But if an alien would land on Earth, coming from a different solar system, and where he evolved through a different process of evolution. To a completely different, and he has basically, uh, uh, and this process has created a brain that has a totally different biology of us, of ours. Uh, his cosmology and his science and his symbolic representation of reality would be different. Okay, so our biology, our neurobiology, dictates 
uh, what the, the model that we build uh, uh, of reality and it's almost is a little bit uh, uh, it's like can't plus you know we are doing can't plus because we go a little above by predicting or proposing a model or how this is created mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, and and uh, we we did uh, touch a little bit on the evolutionary argument, and and that's the distinction between organism versus uh, mechanism. But can you speak a little bit about what you call the tape of life experiment? Yes. Now that's one of my favorite analogies. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould uh, was responsible for that theoretical experiment, and what he used to say is that. If you would record every event, if you could have recorded every event that started happening three and a half billion years ago during evolution that got us here as a species and our brain the way it is, and now you would rewind this tape and let it go again, the chances of getting something like us would be close to zero because you have a, a, a very long sequence of random events happening that probably would never happen in the history of the universe uh, again. So that's how our brain was formed. You know, it basically, this pathway uh, had as an outcome the kind of brain that we have. In fact, we suggest in the book that those that claim they can reverse engineer the brain are basically suggesting some sort of uh, intelligent design scheme. You know, they're, they're basically denying the role of a stochastic processing in evolution, because if they would accept it fully, understand it, perhaps, they would see that it's absurd what they're saying. You cannot reverse engineer a, a stochastic process, you know, uh, of that level of complexity. So Stephen Jay Gould didn't talk about neurobiology, as far as I can tell, you know, from reading some of his work. But I think we adapted that argument to, to our uh, view of why uh, the organism that we call the brain is, uh, un cannot be reproduced uh, by a simple programming. Another perhaps very tightly connected presumption stemming or very well originating in computationalism is also determinism, isn't it? Yeah. Because if you can compute everything, then everything is determined. It's just a mere cause and effect. From the Big Bang onwards, everything is connected. Well, but there's another argument that Ronald was touching when he talked about this, uh, this new term that we're creating, scientific dualism. We are not dualists from the ca Cartesian point of view. Of course not. We don't recognize souls and abstract entities. What we are suggesting is that there is a source of randomness in the brain the generation of these magnetic fields and how they influence the digital component, the neural networks, this is very probabilistic and stochastic. And in, in by being like that, it provides the kind of mechanism that people like Roger Penrose were looking for and uh, chatting the mathematician, an Argentinian mathematician, to, to get some non-deterministic component that could explain things like free will. So our theory actually provides a way for free will to exist because we have found a potential source of non-deterministic processing in the brain at the interface of the digital analog and analog digital interaction. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you've mentioned this kind of new scientific dualism that you're proposing. Uh, can you perhaps uh, talk a little bit about the, the mind-brain kind of uh, distinction, if you will? So, so that because that's that was at the heart of Rene Descartes' classic dualism. So, perhaps, how is your mind brain distinction different, perhaps, or is it? The, the main distinction, of course, is that we are saying that uh, things like higher order functions of the brain, uh, higher cognitive functions, consciousness, all the things that we you know we find to be non computable, they emerge as emergent properties of the digital networks of neurons as analog electromagnetic fields. And that's the reason that when, once these uh, charges produced by neurons are circulating through the white matter that we call biological loops, these biological loops produce these magnetic fields. It is, it is the production of the magnetic field and the interaction 
that they have by induction with the neurons that generates this space that we call mental space. And is in this mental space that is a field, basically a complex electromagnetic field that we see the mind emerging. You know, it's basically an emergent uh, property, a very complex emergent property. And that suggests that along evolution, different levels of consciousness appear in animals, you know, uh, but they explode in higher primates and particularly in humans because of this intrinsic explosion of the white matter that allows these uh, charges to circulate through very intrinsic complex loops and generate, you know, the degree of complexity needed for the kind of mind that we have to emerge. So we are not, we are not proposing that there is a soul or there is nothing supernatural or anything. It's pure uh, uh, physics, but uh, talking to account, taking into account uh, the brain as a generator of emergent properties. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those properties, those emerging properties are analog and therefore non-computable. Yes. Yes. So consciousness, for example, is one of them. Well, consciousness, intelligence, intuition, love of soccer, you know, all these important things of your life cannot, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, be computed. And, but the beauty of it is that the, what we call it the hybrid digital analog computer engine, the model, is a recursive model, you know. So the digital generates the analog, the neuronal spiking generate the electromagnetic fields. The electromagnetic fields induce synchrony in the neurons. These neurons produce other types of fields. So at each moment in time, you are producing a new uh, analog engine. So, and, and this is very much a prediction that came out of the brain machine interface field because I got monkeys that can do movements, repetitive movements, like the arm, like I'm doing here, or walking repetitively. And I look at the neurons to try to find if I had a pattern, if I had a, de a deterministic pattern that always underlines this movement. I was recording three, four hundred neurons, and I was saying, okay, the sequence of recruitment of these neurons should be very identical, very similar, because I'm doing the same movement. It was never the same. I never found the same sequence of neurons. It was all different from trial to trial. I even tell my students that if I let the monkey move the arm like that for the rest of the life of the monkey, I would never see the same sequence of neurons fine. And that can only be explained by the kind of, you know, mechanism that I'm, I'm telling uh, you now. Yeah, and that, of course, is one of the sort of neurophysiological arguments that you put uh, forward. Uh, and, and to be to be honest, like that totally amazed me. Like, for example, the fact that if I remember correctly, you are, you even placed the the electrodes semi randomly. Like, yeah, uh, th that that totally blew my mind. T tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you of course you're going to areas of the cortex that you know are involved in motor generation. You have the primary motor cortex, but you have the other frontal areas and other posterior parietal areas. So, 10 years ago, we recorded in the posterior parietal cortex what nobody would do to control the movement of a robotic arm. And we published this paper in 2003. Well, uh, two days ago, Science Magazine had a paper where uh, Richard Anderson at Caltech had a human doing the robotic arm movement with uh, the posterior parietal cortex. Unfortunately, he didn't cite our paper. I don't know, he may have forgotten. But uh, uh, basically, that was a shock in 2003. We are going here in the posterior parietal, very far from the primary sensory cortex or motor cortex. When you go to the motor cortex, what we notice is that we can basically, we don't need to worry where to put these electrodes. We just drop them in there. And wherever we go, we get cells that modulated their firing rate prior to the movement of the arm. And the interesting thing is not where you are, but is the number of cells that you're recording, the mass of cells in fact, it's the logarithm of the number of neurons recorded that uh, linearly predict how much of the variance of the movement you can simulate. Luckily, and this is an irony of destiny, luckily that part is computable. So I can do a linear algorithm and I can actually get that brain activity to predict the kinematics of an arm. But as you start making more complex movements, we notice that things start getting very difficult to predict. 
just by moving two hands simultaneously, I already have to use a quadratic function, a nonlinear function, and I'm almost not able to do it. I'm in the limit of what I can do it. You see? So there is a threshold. As things get more complicated, as behaviors get more elaborated, uh, or functions get uh, higher, you, you escape the realm of simulation or computability, and you get into the realm of non-computable functions. So that's why you cannot create an algorithm for the love of soccer. No, <laughs> not in, and for this team, Palmeiras, there is no chance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very interesting. So, but 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 then, if if we can switch those uh, areas, why not go in the gut? For example, there's been lots of people suggesting the gut is one potential huge cluster of neural activity, perhaps. Oh, no, there are neurons there, but I'll tell you something that you're going to be very shocked. Remember I mentioned the patients, the paraplegic patients, they recover neurological function by the training? Yeah. We train them to move, right? To move walking. Well, when we look at their global clinical uh, position after the training, they had improvements of heart function, gastrointestinal function. Nobody, I never expected that. So they had better peristaltic movements. They could predict now when they needed to go to the bathroom, something that they couldn't before. Wow. So we are inducing improvements in the parasympathetic and the sympathetic functions in addition to the recovery of neurological functions for locomotion. So that is something that was totally unpredicted. And in parallel to this, uh, if you look at Appendix uh, uh, 1, if you see prediction 11, we just fulfilled that prediction. Uh, the paper is being submitted. Uh, we were able to transform the primary somatosensory cortex of rats into an infrared decoding cortex, uh, which is, a, as you know, mammals cannot see infrared light and they cannot feel infrared light because they don't have receptors in the eyes or in the skin like reptiles have. But we basically were able to just drop the electrical output of an infrared sensor in the somatosensory cortex. And now we have a piece of cortex that processes both tactile and infrared. And the animal doesn't see infrared, it touches light which is a type of synesthesia that, you know, you don't, you don't see in normal, in nature normally, right? So these two results from the paraplegic patients in, in these rat experiments are basically uh, predictions that we had that uh, are very counterintuitive for the classical dogma of neuroscience. No, no David Huben and Weasel uh, 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 fan would predict that you can do that. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fascinating, and and it kind of yeah it it it, it blows my mind. But but uh, let let's move a little bit because time is advancing. So I want to move on to to some of the implications here. So so I have like probably half a dozen different theories alternative to yours. Let me see if we can go through a few of them. So let's talk about first of the most. Uh, the, the biggest one, the, the, the human brain project. Let's be a little bit more specific about what your take is on the future and worthiness uh, of, of investing a billion dollars in the future brain, pro in the human brain project. Um, it's difficult to talk about that because the scope has seemingly changed very much. At the beginning, it was really uh, directed on simulating the brain and trying to learn things about how the brain functions. Uh, by uh, by observing the simulation. I have a feeling now that the scope has largely changed and it's about building databases. Change meaning downscaled or upscaled? Downscaled. 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 Uh, really downscaled. Uh, a warp speed downscale. Because <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard much about that, to be honest with you. Well, but that's another issue. If you're here in Switzerland, you wouldn't hear nothing about this. But if you go in other places in Europe, uh, you will see, because the news were clear, the European Union uh, accepted uh, the criticism of the 600 neuroscientists that published a manifesto last year, 
and they asked for outside reviewers and the outside reviewers are extremely critical and the project was downgraded to an IT project right now. You know, a few years ago, we would hear Henry saying that not only he would simulate the brain, but you didn't need to do any more experiments anymore. You would just do experiments on the simulation of the brain and that was enough, right? Well, that's all gone, uh, as is he. You know, he and uh, his other colleagues, they're not anymore the directors. He, he you mean Henry Macrum? Yeah, he, they, he and the other guy that was the director of the Human Brain Project, the EPFL, are not anymore. Yeah, now it's a geologist. He's a geologist that works at EPFL and, and is a purely an IT project, you know. And what about the funding? Well, the funding is unclear. Uh, what, how much is going to be there and how much is going to be given. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty at this moment. Because that's a big news to me. It ca comes as a big surprise. Basically, it seems like the whole project is collapsing. Oh, it has collapsed. That's my opinion. We can send you the European uh, report that was issued about a month ago and a little more, almost two months ago, and you will read it. And it was accepted in, in its full uh, recommendation and, and, and it's extremely critical. And for me, my own opinion, but this is because I'm Brazilian, uh, it, it is a complete uh, collapse, you know? <laughs> Only because you're Brazilian? Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't understand. No, I'm just kidding. You know, it's just that as a Latin, I can say these things openly. You know? ah, ah, I see. I what see. is happening is that I go to places and people are full of fingers not to say it. Uh -huh. Not to declare there was a tremendous failure, basically. I see. And, and in Europe, uh, uh, for a while, you couldn't even say that. And I'm just afraid because there's an equivalent project in the United States. Yes. And it's also a dismal for me. The, the, the Connectome project? Yeah, the Obama Brain Initiative, unfortunately for me, is going also to totally the erroneous direction because it's just investing in technology development. Because people think, some people, most people today think that science is just making gizmos, you know, developing technology. And it's not that. Uh, and neuroscience for sure. We, we need new instruments, we need new technology, but neuroscience is much more than just doing instrumentation in creating new tools. And that's the problem. Uh, so it, this is a, probably a debate by itself, you know, I, I think. Let me, yeah, Ronald, do you want to add anything? No, uh, I don't believe that at this stage, building so large groups is something valuable. I think those large groups lose a lot of energy fighting among, among themselves and, uh, and uh, playing games. I think uh, let smaller groups work, it would be, it would be much more interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, an, another person that I've interviewed on my show, uh, who has a very kind of contrarian position and who is very vehemently attacked by some neuroscientists, including Ray Kurzweil, who is very kind of subdued, generally speaking, and yet I watched him stand up in a conference and basically look at Dr. Hammer straight in the face and say, we know that's wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm referring to Dr. Stuart Hamroff, whom I've interviewed on my show, and, and more specifically the the orc or theory that Hamroff and Penrose uh, came up together with, their quantum theory of consciousness. What's your take on that? Yeah, uh, I, I think you can never say it's wrong up to now. It's surely not complete. It's Perhaps it's uh, not a procedure that the brain is using, but at this stage, uh, we, have to, we have to leave everything open. That's my feeling. In any case, there's computation in the brain at so many different levels. There's no, not only one level of computation. There's computation at the level down to the molecule, down to the cells. Uh, there are all sorts of computations, and it's possible that some kind of computation is also happening in the microtubule. Why not? Uh, I don't believe in it, but why not? I think we should let things open, especially if it's supported by Penrose. Penrose is a complete genius, so uh, if he supports that, you can't judge it. Let it open for the time being. Yeah, one thing is I think I want to emphasize is that when we mention that theory in our book, we make sure that 
uh, yes, they are looking for a mechanism, a non-deterministic mechanism at the quantum level. Uh, we, do, we didn't rule out the, that that can happen, that you may have a quantum mechanism, but we can explain the phenomenology that we're trying to explain at the systems level. Without needing it. Without having to evoke a quantum mechanism. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It could exist. They are, mutually, they are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. But uh, since we have no insight, experimental insight on the quantum aspects, uh, but we have a lot in the systems level, uh, yeah. we feel that we have a sufficient enough theory by itself, you know. True. Absolutely true, Miguel. But what, what is annoying for me is what you said, uh, uh, Nicola. How can he say we know it's not correct? Oh, he certainly what, does. What, what is this kind of arrogance? How, how do we know? Isn't science a question of modesty, of uh, being open? It's not a question of judging. We don't know. Nobody has gone and, see, and seen that. We, we cannot know. To be honest, I was a bit, I was very surprised because I've never seen Ray Kurzweil so adamant and so forthcoming and, and focused on negative. Yeah, it, kills, it, it would kill his approach. Well, just, just wait until he read our book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we, we touched on some of the implications uh, on the general community and some of the other theories, but what about clinical implications? Mm. Well, yeah, that's that's a very interesting because the, the average person on the street couldn't care less about who's right. They care about how can their life be impacted if especially if they suffer from certain certain yeah, conditions. But, but Nicola, there was there are two sides of this coin in my opinion. One is we are saying that the singularity is baloney, okay? It's going not going to happen. However, there is a much bigger threat, in our opinion, that goes to the very core of the point that you're making right now, is the fact that the more we are told that it may happen, and the more we are exposed to technology the way we are being exposed, the more human, the range of human behaviors are being curtailed, are being narrowed, because we are always starting to behave like uh, a very you know, or using a very narrow number of behaviors in our daily life. So I'll give an example. In any subway that you walk now, in any part of the planet, Sao Paulo, Tokyo, uh, Zurich, uh, New York, people are doing the same thing. They're looking at their hands. They're looking into a, a phone and they're doing exactly the same things. And this is reducing the range of yeah. our, uh, the variety and the diversity of human behaviors through a process that we call mechanization or robotization of human behavior. This is the much stronger, much more dangerous risk that we are uh, taking by, you know, just plunging into this world of, of being surrounded by all these new uh, technologies without thinking about it. Is that what you think is the biggest threat now? Oh, oh yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. Believing that uh, the human being is a mechanics that is false, has a terrible consequence is that we are treating him as a mechanical object and he is becoming a mechanical object because if he doesn't behave mechanically he feels he's out of the game he feels he's uh, oh, he's not he's special he's not accepted so he be behaves more and more mechanically and uh, i'm i'm quite older uh, older than you are but i can see the difference 50 years ago things were not like that people did not behave this way uh, there's a big change, and we 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 don't see it in in everyday life, but we are becoming more and more robotized. We are accepting more and more to follow rules, strict rules, and losing the human part of what what we are. Yeah, and the consequences are very severe because at the limit, we actually should have included an extra chapter, a chapter eight here, to discuss the social consequences of being sold on the idea of the singularity. Because the problem is this, the brain will take anything you give it to it if you put a reward value attached to that message, okay? So if you give to the brain of our kids uh, and our grandchildren the message, you need to behave this way to be rewarded in society, to be accepted, to get good jobs, to be recognized, you know, the brain will take that. 
and we'll shape its own functioning according to these statistics you're giving to it, okay? And once you do that, at the limit of our analysis, what you kill is dissent, is the ability to be different, the ability to be uh, uh, not agreeing with this, you know, uh, crowd pack behavior that is dragging you to this very narrow distribution of human behaviors. So I think the challenge and the big threat in our opinion here is that that's the reason we say that this book was written by a motivation of protecting human nature and human the human condition, because we see the danger of mechanization and some of the things that people in artificial intelligence are proposing to do uh, to actually impact on the future of our minds. You know, from the clinical point of view, uh, we are going to advance with the uh, with the possibility of merging brains and machines because it can be done. The, most of what we want to recover and, and treat in humans so far seems to be computable. Simple human behaviors, motor behaviors, uh, restoring tactile uh, feedback, perhaps even restoring some low level visual uh, tactile uh, visual feedback with uh, uh, prosthetic devices. So these, these are going to evolve, but the important thing is we need to know where is the limit. We need to know how far we can go because you are going to see very soon uh, new applications of brain machine interfaces, not in patients. You're going to see in, in regular human beings because it's clear that you also can augment some functions. Yeah, and we have experiments in rats and monkeys that show clearly that you can augment the range of perceptual, you can improve motor skills, and this is going to come. And this is going to be a, a very important debate. What is ethically acceptable? How far can we go? And, and because uh, that can be done. I can assure you. And, and that's worth of a whole other episode uh, in its own right, by the way which I hope we have the opportunity to, to do at some point later on. But uh, let me ask you this, though, because that's actually exactly the core of one of the questions that I try to address and discuss quite often in my uh, on my blog, and that is what is to be human and how does technology change the meaning and or the question itself, or does it? So, so can you tell us what in your view is to be human? here and, and that you're referring to because if you're saying we're losing something then I mean we have to be I think a little bit more specific what is it that we're losing what do you think it is well I can start you know uh, since in memorial time since the, the, the dawn of our species we have tried to build tools to increase our reach into the world and now we know that in addition to being very proficient in building tools Actually, the research on brain-machine interface in the last 15 years has shown, that in, uh, in addition to being the homo habilis, the homo, homo that creates tools, we are the homo that uh, assimilates tools as an extension of us. So our sense of self is plastic enough to incorporate a piece of artificial machinery that our brains created as an extension of our body. So if I put a robot, the prediction we made and is pretty much being confirmed now. I was in NASA three weeks ago and pretty much people are seeing some of the things we predicted. If you put a rover on the surface of Mars and there is someone continuously controlling the rover and getting feedback from it, there is a moment where that guy becomes extremely proficient in controlling that device because that device has been assimilated by the brain as part of him. It's like a car or a bike. Okay. So our sense of self is not static, and you can really change it, what you perceive as being your body or, you know, your, your existence, physical existence, okay? What we are talking about here is that the moment you start interacting with uh, the kind of technologies that we're building now, which are you know, of a different magnitude, because this is not a plier or a hammer anymore, this is something that allows, and by the way, your sense of self, according to that theory, also includes the people you relate socially. Mm -hmm. So your spouse, your kids, your parents, if you're in contact with people continuously, uh, according to our theory, uh, your sense of self has incorporated these people as part of you. Okay, so we are social animals, it's not, a, it's not by accident. That's very intrinsically embedded in our brains, mm -hmm. the need 
to be connected. And that explains probably this the success of social media, you know, because now we can be connected to thousands of people all the time, right? Uh, but it's well known that uh, certain uses of technology are reducing our attention span, are overloading our short-term memory. Uh, there is a, a phenomenal study of more than one now showing that tax drivers in London that are relying more and more on GPS to drive instead of the usual old style of knowing everything are having reductions of the hippocampus, a part of the brain that is coding spatial uh, coordinates. So it's very obvious that we are reaching a point in which technology is affecting what we are. And that's, I think, a very key debate. I'm trying to remember who was it that said first we build the tools and then the tools build us. But I can't remember who it was. Nice. Well, it's a very nice. Well, there's a, an equivalent metaphor that I just read in a book called Sapiens, The Brief Story of Mankind. Yeah. It's a great book. Yuval Harari. I've been trying to get him on my show. Yeah. Well, he's a very interesting guy. You should. I really appreciate that book. Uh, in fact, you can tell him that he has a neurobiology fan, <laughs> uh, neurobiologist fan. Uh, he says something there very interesting. It was not necessarily men that domesticate wheat. Wheat domesticated men. You know, wheat was able to survive and expand because he, he, he captured the imagination and the taste of men. So men would carry it all over the, the planet, you know, and it's a piece of grass if you think about it. Yeah. So once you, once you homogenize behavior, once you create reward for uh, teenagers and kids to be doing the same iPad finger movements, the same websites, the same kind of uh, generalized, uh, uh, generalized, no, the same kind of specific tasks in detriment of others, you are uh, reducing, reducing the overall uh, capacity of the overall output of behaviors of that brain. And I think that is our main message here. You know, that the singularity is not true, it's just a detail. You know, for, it, it's obvious that it's not true at this point. <laughs> but, but there is something much bigger here. You know, we are not machines uh, and we will never be. And there is something very important to preserve uh, called human nature and human culture and human condition. And that is a stake mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. <clears throat> There's one point I want to add. Uh, we understand things. We have a notion of understanding. We have a feeling that we have understood something. Uh, to my best knowledge, a computer doesn't understand anything. He cannot understand. He's not equipped to understand. Understand that has no meaning for him. He only computes. Uh, so understanding is something really deeply, importantly, human. Uh, there are lots of things who are happening now and who are diminishing the value of understanding. Uh, with big data, for instance, uh, correlations become more important than real understanding. But understanding is, is, is really the deep human thing uh, we need to understand. Understanding is also very rewarding. Um, and I wouldn't like uh, us to, 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 to get too far away and to forget understanding. Mm -hmm. I, I think here you shared a little bit uh, actually uh, from your own personal ethics, which is kind of ve very important. And, and I like to kind of bring it forth usually during my interview. So we get insight into your personalities and where you're coming from. Uh, ethically speaking, if you will. And I'd like to, to, to keep you for another 90 minutes and, and go even deeper to where we've been now. But unfortunately, we're going to have to do that on another occasion where I hope that we can do that in person. And, and I have my team and, and we have a proper broadcast quality interview because I think this conversation deserves it. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm going to have to bring our conversation to an end here. So let me ask you, for those of our viewers and listeners who are interested in following up your work, uh, reading more in depth about it, what's the best place to go? Other than the book, which is, uh, again, The Relativistic Brain. They, they can find the book in, in Amazon. Uh, it's going to be very soon. We have an English version, but we are going to have 
for the Canadian French speaking Canadians we're going to have a French version very soon uh, Portuguese version uh, German uh, Russian and probably Italian and Chinese too very soon uh, and it's going to be all done by Kios Press which is also part of our new idea of creating a, a publisher company that is there not to really make much money but to, to address key issues and key uh, themes on our uh, contemporaneous society that's number one but we are planning of course to have uh, a small uh, series of uh, activities like a youtube channel uh, where we are going to talk among ourselves and our friends uh, about these issues that we are going to announce very soon uh, also, uh, our new website is going to come up when we launch officially the book in a few weeks. And what we want is really to have a conversation with as many people as possible, because we want to bring this team to the forefront of, of the you know, global debate. And uh, we, when we talk about this, uh, we really believe that what we just talked to you about, the preservation of the human condition, is as important, perhaps even more at a short time, than even uh, uh, global warming, you know? This, this is a real serious issue because it impacts on the education of our children, on the preservation of our culture, and we want to establish this conversation with as many people as we can. And so, in addition to this book, we are preparing a much longer book, a much bigger uh, argument, uh, not only about the, the computational ability, but what the brain is about, really. Well, I'm looking forward to, to that book. And uh, if you need any help with uh, your YouTube channel, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to give you some, some uh, uh, hints or help or advice. If, if That'll you, be great. That if you be... will, because I have a little bit of experience on that front. Um, are you planning to, to come for a conference or something to Toronto, to Canada? Or should I f try and figure out the way how I make it to you one day so we do this in person? Yeah, well, I don't have, no, we don't have at this point an invitation. I have been in Toronto many times. I have lots of friends there at the University of Toronto in the medical school. Uh, I don't remember having a, a conference or a, a talk. One of the things we want to do when we get the book going is to go around the world talking about, you know, these issues. And, of course, it would be great to, to, to meet in, in some, some time or somewhere, if not in Toronto, you know, in another Canadian a location uh, or even if you want we could do that in my lab yeah in do in Duran or in Brazil or here in, in Switzerland you know uh, but I think it would be great to have a personal conversation for yeah. sure yeah I think so too I think I can actually it's a, it's about I don't know 15 hour drive for me but it's it's not impossible uh, to, to Duke University uh, okay guys so the final question I always ask at the very end of my interview is this we've been talking to you about some very important deep issues for about 90 minutes. What's the most important thing in your view? What's the final message that you'd like to impart on our audience as, as a way of saying uh, goodbye? Yeah, I would say that uh, I would join the social aspect. What we believe will become some kind of reality in the future. So we better believe in mankind if we want to continue existing. If we believe that man is a machine, that's what we will become also. Yeah, I, I would like to say something similar. Uh, uh, coming from someone that works with technology and interface brains to technology, I want to categorically say that yes, we can use machines to the betterment of mankind, but we will never become a machine. If we want to continue to be humans, and we make that option to preserve our culture and our condition, we will use machines for, for, for the best of our species, but uh, we will never be one of them. Dr. Miguel Nicolilis and Ronald Sicurel, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mikela. Yeah.